Welcome back to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silvershots, Galvin, and Gagne, published by Wiley Publishing. In the last series of lessons, we were discussing one of the main management systems of an operating system, the memory management system. Now we're going to move on to another area of operating system management. Some authors refer to it as device management. Our author refers to it as mass storage management. Nevertheless, it is the system's ability to manage external resources such as secondary storage of our computer. So why don't we get started? In this unit, we'll be discussing what some authors refer to as the device management system, which we will be studying in two parts, the mass storage system and the input-output systems. Some of you may already be familiar with some of this from your early introductory classes, but it never hurts to review the topic one more time. We'll talk a little about the system board architecture and how mass storage, the non-volatile storage system of a computer, is structured. We've just concluded that unit on volatile storage, the main memory or primary storage of the computer. The main mass storage system in modern computers is secondary storage, which is usually provided by the hard disk drives and non-volatile memory devices, such as solid state drives. If you consider that program code had to be input and output from somewhere, the earliest form of non-volatile storage was the punch card. In fact, the original giant of computer makers, IBM, worked very hard to delay the end of their precious key punch equipment. However, the punch card was doomed to be replaced by the magnetic tape systems that are still in use today as a form of tertiary storage. That is to say, they're used for long-term backup. Storage devices have included at one time or another magnetic tape, floppy disk drives, and optical disk drives, and even cloud storage. Magnetic disk drive is still the dominant form of secondary storage in use today. All those solid state drives are becoming more and more popular for small systems because of their speed and reliability. The basic components of a hard drive are one or more platters that spin, bringing the data under read-write heads that move back and forth over the disks. Data access is determined by the speed the data is being brought under the read-write head. That's referred to as rotational latency. The time it takes for the read-write head to move across the tracks to the data, that's referred to as seek time, and the time it takes to retrieve the data and send it across the bus to the CPU. That's referred to as transfer time. As you can see, the operation of the hard drive is greatly mechanical, with spinning disks and moving heads. The heads, by the way, are moving across the tracks to read the data, but they are not touching the disk. They're simply floating across the surface. If a head ever does touch the disk, we may easily have a system crash. That's one reason why it's not good to toss your laptop with a hard disk drive in it down on the couch when you get home. You may live to regret that toss. The drive is attached to the computer via input-output buses, and the buses may be of a number of different types, including those listed here. There's the EIDE, ATA, SATA, S-A-T-A, which is one of the most common, USB, which is what you use with your flash drive, fiber channel, SCSC, which is usually referred to as SCSI, SAS and FireWire. The host controller in the computer uses the bus to talk to the disk controller that's built into the drive or storage array. We'll talk more about input and output later. Each platter has a flat circular shape, usually made of some metallic material. Therefore, the name hard disk drive. Common platter diameters range from 1.8 to 3.5 inches. The two surfaces of a platter are covered with a magnetic material, magnetic oxide. 
we store information by recording it magnetically on the platters and we read information by detecting the magnetic pattern on the platters. A read-write head floats just above each surface of every platter. As I said, if it touches the surface of the platter, we have a problem. The heads are attached to a disc arm that moves all heads as a unit. The surface of a platter is logically divided into circular tracks, which are subdivided into sectors. So as just described, all heads move together from outermost tracks to the innermost tracks and vice versa. The set of tracks at a given arm position make up a cylinder. There may be thousands of concentric cylinders in one disk drive, and each track may contain hundreds of sectors. Each sector has a fixed size and is the smallest unit of transfer. You remember our discussion of memory management where we said that a page, frame, and sector could all possibly be the same size. Using that sector size could be a convenient way to determine the size of the three units. The storage capacity of a common disk drive is measured in gigabytes and terabytes. That's interesting. The authors wrote gigabytes and terabytes. At one time they were measured in megabytes. We wouldn't even worry about fooling around with a disk drive that was limited to a certain number of megabytes. A disk drive motor spins at a high speed. Most drives rotate at 60 to 250 times per second, specified in terms of rotations per minute. Common drives spin at 5400, 7200, 10,000, and 15,000 RPM. Some drives power down when not in use and spin up upon receiving an input-output request. You remember that rotational latency refers to the time it takes to move the sector around to the arm of the read-write head. It doesn't sound so long, does it? As I mentioned, the transfer rate is the rate at which data flows between the drive and the computer. Another performance aspect to positioning time, or random access time, consists of two parts. The time necessary to move the disk arm to the desired cylinder, called seek time, and the time necessary for the desired sector to rotate to the disk head, called rotational latency. A typical disk can transfer tens to hundreds of megabytes of data per second, and they have seek times and rotational latencies of several milliseconds. They increase performance by having dynamic RAM buffers in the drive controller. The disk flies on an extremely thin cushion of air or some other gas, like helium, and there is a danger that the head will make contact with the disk surface. While the disk platters are coated with a protective layer, the head will sometimes damage the disk surface. As I've already told you, the accident is called a head crash. This is, this is serious. A head crash normally cannot be repaired, and the entire disk must be replaced. And the data and the disk are lost, unless they were backed up with other storage. Even then, we may lose some of the recently added data, especially if we've done a lot of work since our last backup. Hard disk drives are sealed units, and some chassis that hold hard disk drives allow their removal without shutting down the system or storage chassis. Other types of storage media are also removable, such as CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray discs. Non-volatile memory devices are growing in importance. Simply described, non-volatile memory devices are electrical rather than mechanical. While tossing the laptop on the table is still not a good idea, at least with these, it won't cause a head crash. Most commonly, such a device is composed of a controller and flash NANDI semiconductor chips, which are used to store the data. Other non-volatile memory technologies exist, like dynamic RAM, with battery backing so it doesn't lose its contents. Flash memory, non-volatile memory, like you see on the right side of the screen, is frequently used as a disk drive-like container. 
you'll see these refer to as solid state drives. I have one and it's fantastic. In other instances, it takes the form of a USB drive, also called a thumb drive or a flash drive, or a dynamic RAM stick. It is also surface mounted onto motherboards as the main storage in devices like smartphones. In all forms, it acts and can be treated in the same way. Non-volatile memory devices can be more reliable than hard disk drives because they have no moving parts and can be faster because they have no seek time or rotational latency. In addition, they consume less power. On the other hand, they are more expensive per megabyte than traditional hard disk and have less capacity than the larger hard drives. Over time, however, the capacity of non-volatile memory devices has increased faster than the hard disk drive capacity, and their price has dropped more quickly, so their use is increasing dramatically. I'm a big fan of solid-state drive. When you see how quickly your computer boots up and how quickly program and data retrieval occurs, you will be too. In fact, solid-state drives and similar devices are now used in some laptop computers to make them smaller, faster, and more energy efficient. Because non-volatile memory devices can be much faster than the hard disk drives, the standard bus interfaces can cause a major limit on throughput. Some NVM devices are designed to connect directly to the system bus, PCIe for example. This technology is changing other aspects of computer design as well. Some systems use it as a direct replacement for disk drives, while others use it as a new cache tier, moving data among magnetic disk, NVM, and main memory to optimize performance. Generally, the single NVM device, like a hard disk drive, can have a catastrophic failure in which it corrupts or fails to reply to read-write requests. To allow data to be recovered in those cases, RAID protection is used. Back in the early 80s, my wife owned a small gift shop and I was in the personal computer business. I decided that I would put a PC in her shop to use as a point of sale and inventory control system. So I wrote the programs for her and set up a demo computer for her to use in the shop. At the time we were still using floppy disks for storage and I found that the system was just too slow because the inventory lookup took so much time. Customers would be backed up at the checkout waiting for that slow floppy disk to find each item purchased. A single customer who bought several items would have to wait an unacceptable amount of time. You can imagine what other customers standing in line thought. So I created a RAM drive. Now this just means that I designated a portion of main memory to behave like a disk drive. So I would load the inventory file into the RAM drive at boot up and create a temp file to write individual transactions to the floppy drive as they occurred. You understand that writing a single record to the end of a set of records takes very little time, unlike having to look up a record from that same list. So whenever the salesperson entered a part number, the inventory item came up instantly. Each morning at boot up, I had the software update the permanent inventory record in secondary storage from that temp file from the previous day, and then copy it to the RAM drive. During the day, as far as the operating system was concerned, that section of main memory was a secondary storage disk drive. It worked like a champ. Why was it necessary to do that posting each morning? Because RAM is volatile. When you shut off power or in the event of a power failure, everything in RAM is gone, which means that the inventory file would be gone. RAM drives which are known by many names, including RAM disks, act like secondary storage but are created by device drivers that carve out a section of system's dynamic RAM and present it to the rest of the system as if it were a storage device. 
these quote unquote drives can be used as raw block devices, but more commonly file systems are created on them for standard file operations. Much more modern computers than the one I was using back then already have buffering and caching, so what is the purpose of yet another use of dynamic RAM for temporary data storage? After all, dynamic RAM is volatile, and data on a RAM drive does not survive a system crash, shutdown, or power down. Caches and buffers are allocated by the programmer or the operating system, whereas RAM drives allow the user, as well as the programmer, to place data in memory for temporary safekeeping using standard file operations. In fact, RAM drive functionality is useful enough that such drives are found in all major operating systems. On Linux, there is slash dev slash ram. On Mac OS, there's the diskutil command that creates them. Windows has them via third-party tools, and Solaris and Linux create slash temp at boot time of the type IMPFS, which is a RAM drive. RAM drives are useful as high-speed temporary storage locations. Although NVM devices are fast, dynamic RAM is much faster. And input-output operations to RAM drives are the fastest way to create, read, write, and delete files and their contents. Many programs use, or could benefit from using, RAM drives by storing temporary files which is what I did in that shop over 30 years ago. Programs can share data easily by writing and reading files from a RAM drive. For another example, Linux at boot time creates a temporary root file system, an itrd, that allows other parts of the system to have access to a root file system and its contents before the parts of the operating system that understand storage devices are loaded. Well, I think that's a good place to stop for this lesson. So go back, review your notes, update your study guide, and when you're ready, come on back and we'll go to lesson two.